Hello, everybody, and thank you for coming today to our first edition of our new online course format. Um, I'm Dr. Pearl, and today I'm going to go over some of the syllabus changes and begin a section on radiocarbon dating. First thing I want to go over today is the concept of the half-life. Now, a half-life is the time required for half of a radioactive substance to decay into a stable form. Uh, the time it takes uh, for, I should say, approximately half of a radioactive isotope to decay into a stable form. This is going to apply to uh, this is going to apply to any uh, radioactive substance. So if we have a line here, we have zero half lives, one, two three, four, five half-lives. This is going to represent uh, at one half-life approximately 50% of your radioactive isotope uh, is present. At two half-lives, half of that will be present, so 25% is left. At three half lives, it'll be 12.5%. At four half lives, it's going to be 6.25%. And at five half lives, it's going to be 3.125%, and so forth and so on. So let's make this a line that goes from zero to five half lives. And then on this other axis, we'll put uh, the percent that you have available. So this will be the percent. You're going to find that the decay rate is something like this, except where this doesn't really ever touch the bottom. And you essentially, so this represents the percent, uh, percent. Um, of, uh, in this case, C14 uh, remaining. This percent C14 remaining. So uh, this is a pretty, pretty straightforward chart. If I were to tell you that uh, something is uh, two half lives old um, you could look at the little chart right here and you could say okay well this is 25 percent of the original materials remaining and likewise if i tell you that you have a sample that only has 12.5 percent of what you would expect in a modern sample uh, you can tell me that that's three half lives old the question is well how long is a half life So the Earth's surface is constantly being bombarded with solar radiation. And the atmosphere, our atmosphere, is made up largely of uh, nitrogen and oxygen and carbon in the form of like CO2. Um, these are the, so these are the three main uh, components of our atmosphere. Um, and nitrogen is, uh, if you look at these on the periodic table, you'll find that these are right next to each other. Let's see, we've got uh, nitrogen, uh, which is 
protons and seven neutrons. Gives an atomic weight of, four, of 14. We've got oxygen, which is eight. Eight, which gives an atomic weight of 16. Um, oh, and carbon, which is six. Six, or atomic weight of 12. Uh, so I should have put this over here and put that back over this way. There we go. That'll work better. Sorry, you have to sit through my mistakes. All right, so if you uh, take a look at this, you're going to see carbon, six protons, six neutrons. The weights of the atomic weight is, um, if you remember from chemistry, the atomic weight is uh, the combining those two together, 12, 14, and 16. Well, so we call nitrogen, in this case, we're going to call nitrogen, nitrogen 14. That's the standard nitrogen. And we're going to call carbon carbon 12. All right, so what happens is in the atmosphere, you have this uh, introduction of solar radiation coming in and it attacks a, or it, it impacts a nitrogen 14 atom and it pops one of those neutrons out, or excuse me, it pops one of those protons out and it converts it into a neutron, which gives us uh, an atom with only six protons. And once it only has, instead of having seven protons, it now has six protons and it begins acting uh, very much like carbon. But it still has 14 total protons and neutrons, so it's carbon 14. It's actually carbon uh, six, eight, uh, six protons, eight neutrons. So we have nitrogen 14 is converted into carbon 14 through this process of atmospheric irradiation. Once this carbon is in the atmosphere, it works just like every other carbon and it forms, for example, CO2, um, uh, among other things, where it's incorporated into nature. Uh, through the process of photosynthesis. So these plants will take in carbon through the process of photosynthesis. They take in carbon and along comes uh, a plant or an animal Sorry, along comes an animal. Now, what do we got here? It's a little horse comes along. The horse ingests the uh, plants. We'll make it a palomino. And the animals incorporate the radioactive carbon into their bodies this way. What you end up here is a system in which there's a tiny fraction of carbon-14 in the atmosphere uh, the same fraction is in the plants and the same fraction is in the animals. In other words, all living creatures on the surface of the earth, um, uh, creatures that exchange air uh, with uh, the atmosphere, are in, equilibri are in equilibrium. And they all have about one in every trillion carbon atoms that's part of their um, organism is a C14 atom. So long as this creature is alive, it will continue to take in new carbon-14 all the time, uh, keeping its body in equilibrium. But if one of these creatures should stop taking in new carbon, uh, that is, it dies,
Now this tree, for example, is no longer going to take in new uh, carbon-14. Um, sort of, it's a sort of clock is set, so to speak. Um, over the next uh, five, 6,000 years, uh, this tree, the, the radioactive carbon in this tree is going to decay. It's going to convert back into nitrogen-14 and dissipate as a gas. So if you have a piece of charcoal, If you have a piece of archaeological charcoal, charcoal that you've recovered from an archaeological site, and you uh, say you weigh this piece of charcoal, five uh, grams, um, you can calculate um, how many atoms it has of carbon in it. Um, we're going to just call that X. It has X atoms of carbon, 12. And you know that if every one trillion um, every, in every one trillion carbon-12 atoms, there's going to be a carbon-14 atom, then you can also estimate that there is X divided by uh, one trillion C14 atoms. So what you need is a counting device that could tell you uh, how many atoms of carbon-12 you have and how many atoms of carbon-14 you have and uh, see um, what the ratio is. And this is precisely what radiocarbon dating does. It measures the uh, it measures the atoms. At least this is what one type of radiocarbon dating does. The type of radiocarbon dating we're going to talk about is called AMS dating, which stands for Accelerator Mass Spectrometry. Accelerator mass spectrometry, and in this particular uh, type of measurement, uh, the at, uh, the um, charcoal is um, put through a particle accelerator, and uh, the particle accelerator uh, begins to, the atoms literally begin to pull apart based on their weight, and it's able to actually count uh, individual atoms within uh, a margin of error. And um, once they're done with that, they have a certain number of atoms that they expect uh, to be um, in the sample. If there is 50% as much of what they expect, then they know that it's been sitting there for at least one half-life. If it only has 25% of what they expect, then it has been sitting there for two half-lives, etc. And that's essentially how the principle works. So let me summarize. We'll begin with the principle of a half-life, the time required for approximately half of a radioactive substance to decay to a stable form. Now this would apply to any radioactive material. All radioactive materials have a half-life, and all radioactive materials um, are uh, over time going to convert themselves into some kind of stable form. Remember though in the case of carbon uh, in the case of carbon 14 it's converting itself back into nitrogen 14. Nitrogen 14 is a gas and so when we find an object uh, that had carbon 14 in it um, any carbon 14 that is missing uh, is now in the atmosphere. It's gone back into the atmosphere providing us with a convenient way of gauging time. Carbon-14 is initially created in the atmosphere um, by solar radiation. Um, solar radiation impacts the nitrogen, converting some of it, a small fraction, into carbon-14. And the universe treats carbon-14 like any other carbon atom um, thereby incorporating it into sort of the global ecosystem, uh, beginning with photosynthesis, getting it into the plant world, and then it gets into the animal world um, that way. And essentially, uh, all living creatures have about the same fraction of radiocarbon as does the atmosphere. 
So when an organism dies, it stops taking in new carbon and the existing carbon-14 in the organism disappears at the rate of the half-life. C14 is measured with a particle accelerator in a method called accelerator mass spectrometry. There's several other ways of, of uh, estimating the amount of carbon-14 in an object, but we're going to focus on accelerator mass spectrometry. When you do your readings, they will introduce you to a few other methods. Now, the question you've all been waiting for, the answer you've all been waiting for, the half-life of radiocarbon is 5,730 years. That means that after 5,730 years, approximately half of the radioactive material uh, will have decayed mm -hmm. into a stable form. So here's a sample test question. A sample is counted and the lab determines um, that it contains uh, about 12 percent of the C14 in a modern sample. How old is the sample? Well, to figure this out, you need to first you need to know how many half lives it is, and then you can multiply that number by the number of years. And I will tend to give you questions uh, that where the half-life is more or less uh, any, uh, a whole number. Number of half-lives will be a whole number. So in this case we it's not 50 percent. Half of that would be 25 percent. Half of that is 12 and a half percent. Half of that is 6.125 so that's too little. So 12 and a half percent is the number we're looking for. That's one, two, three half lives, and three times five thousand seven hundred and thirty. I believe is uh, 5, 10, 15, 17,190. So seventeen thousand one hundred and ninety years is the approximate age of the sample. Now the lab will always give you uh, a bit of error in there. So they'll say something like um, 17190 plus or minus 30BP. That means 17,190 plus or minus 30 years. So there's a that's your your error range. BP. Now BP is an interesting number. You're always going to see radiocarbon years reported in BP, and that stands for before present. And present is defined as 1950. And that's the date, that's the year in which the first radiocarbon results were presented. And so as a, as a way of making all uh, published radiocarbon dates um, compatible with one another, um, scientists have chosen to use 1950 as the date from which all um, radiocarbon dates will be published. And since radiocarbon is not very good at um, doing samples that are... Uh, you know, you know, only 20, 30, 40, 50 years old. It's uh, helpful anyway. We're usually talking about samples that are thousands of years old, so those numbers are reported before 1950 or before present. 
um, in uh, in an advanced lecture, um, I'll talk about um, how do you convert this BP into calendar years for real, um, because there's a lot of complications involved um, and limitations. Let me let me talk about the first limitation though. The first major limitation um, is that you can't count what isn't there. Come back over here. Limitations. So how good is your AMS device? How good is your machine at detecting trace amounts of C14? Exactly how many half-lives can go by before there is no C14 left to measure? Well, beta analytics says 10 half-lives is about it. Well, they don't exactly say that, but what they do say is that if a sample is older than about 60,000 years, that's about as old as they can detect. 60,000 years, that's the max range of radiocarbon dating, according to Beta Analytic. Now, Beta Analytic is a company, um, a private company that does uh, radiocarbon analysis. And for your homework, you're going to be going to Beta Analytic and reading and doing a little bit of research on um, on radiocarbon from their website. So without any further ado, let me uh, refer you to www.radiocarbon.com and that's their website. You should uh, check out eCampus and look for the homework assignment. Also, by now, you should see uh, Concept Quiz 1 should be up on eCampus, and you can take it at your leisure. Um, I'm allowing you to take uh, this particular quiz, uh, Concept Quiz 1, as many times as you need to, and we'll just use your high score. Um, that won't be the case on other concept quizzes, but this will give you an idea of the kinds of things you should be looking for. So study your notes, make sure you understand it, and then go to uh, radiocarbon.com and do a little bit of reading, and then take your concept quiz, and uh, you'll be done for today. All right, that's all. I hope this works. Um, bear with me. We'll try to get through this together.